Okay. Yes, well, welcome everybody. Um, it's, we just, Brian and I just talked about this. It's been several years that I've been doing this now, interviewing um, people with experience. And, okay. okay. Yes, well, welcome everybody. Just to, there we go. Mute that. So, yes, the first time I heard of Yeti or Bigfoot or Sasquatch, whatever you call it, the forest people, was as a, as a young um, teenager from the comic book of Tintin in Tibet. Some of you might remember Tintin. And I was always intrigued by the possibility of such beings being, being real. I fantasized about them being real. And... Yes, as we advance with C5, learning how to make contact through coherent consciousness and, and opening our hearts, it happens to many of us, at least it did with me, that we also make contact with intelligent beings sharing Earth with us. A bit over a year ago, I was doing C5 with the New Zealand team on the South Island. And now, in New Zealand, there are no mammals, except for a few opossums who have been brought in from Australia. So New Zealand is a bird country. And one night we were out on a bumpy field next to a forest. And during a break, um, yes, often close proximity contact happens during breaks. Jeremy, Jeremy and I wandered off and we stood there in the field and we, we heard big, clunky noises coming from the forest. And Jeremy, who is superb at copying sounds, spoke to, to them. And we asked them, invited them to come closer. We then heard thumping, clunking, bipedal footsteps come right up to us. We never saw anything, but the footsteps stopped one meter away from us. And that is pretty close, even for humans to stand so close in an open field, that would be unnatural. And then I visited Bavaria and the place I've been staying at has a little bit of woods, but nothing that would make you think there is enough habitat for, for Bigfoot people. But the more we did CE5 and the more I would go to that particular spot, signs would pop, pop up and um, others would see it too. They would see, we would see shadows moving and they weren't flapping and they weren't hopping. It was just a smooth um, movement. And uh, it's a part of the woods that I associate with a feeling of love. And so when Corinne told me about Brian Kenworthy from, from their team in Canada and his experiences, what he sees and how he sees the forests, my interest was piqued. I knew I wanted to speak with Brian and learn from him. And of course, I'd like to share this experience with, with all of you. And it's, it's truly an honor, Brian, to be in your virtual presence. So, Brian, would you like to share a bit about how things came about for you? Okay, Ona, thank you very much. Yeah, that's pretty nice of you to say all those good things. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Welcome. I'm just a regular fellow that's gone through life and experienced many crazy things that you wouldn't even think were possible, but I get to see them. Um, it first started when I was like seven, eight years old. My younger brother and I we were watching cartoons in the living room. We take the blankets off our beds and make a little fort with the kitchen chairs. And I said to my brother, I said, watch this. And I pointed at the TV and I said, TV, shut off. And the TV shut off. And there I am like, you know, eight years old saying, what the hell was that? Of course, the TV wouldn't turn back on, and my father had to push 
the little button on the back of the TV to reset it, and then it finally started. The next strange thing happened when in grade three, the teacher says, why are you here? Why, you know, to the class, why are you here? And I said, we're here for an experiment. I remember saying that. Um, a number of near death encounters, you know, like getting run over by a tractor and falling off snowmobiles and barbed wire fences in the winter with skidoos and things of that nature, but I always was saved. Um, I grew up in Quebec in, I was born in 1959. I left in 1978 during the FLQ crisis in Quebec where they wanted to liberate and they got rid of 500,000 English speaking Quebecers. So I came west to Alberta and I got a job on the railroad at 19 years old. And I spent 36 years driving trains in the Rocky Mountains across the prairies. And while everybody's in bed sleeping at night, I'm up and I'm driving the trains across the country, seeing that the commerce of the nation is taken care of. And the things that I see from my office windows as we roll across the country and the things that my brothers have seen through those windows. So when I got to Alberta, the first books that came to my hand were uh, Carlos Castaneda, right? We all, we all did Carlos Castaneda. So that was the first one. And then of course the, the Monroe Institute came into my life, Robert A. Monroe. Journeys out of the body. So that was fascinating how we could get out of the body with tech. And then, of course, uh, Chariots of the Gods. And that started me onto the Sasquatch subject. And I didn't know anything about Sasquatch until 2008. But in uh, 1982, I was on the north rim of the Grand Canyon on my motorcycle. And there was something in the forest. And it walked around our camp around and around and around. And there were three of us and we uh, decided to charge this thing. So I pulled out my little Swiss army knife and opened up the blade, click, and we ran into the forest, charge! And we couldn't find nothing. We went back into our camp spot where we had a little fire and this thing walked around us all night long. You could just hear it, crunch, crunch, crunch. Anyway, we got real good and drunk and fell asleep. I said, if it's going to kill us, it can kill us in our sleep. I put up a tripwire with fishing lines and beer cans and nothing happened. Another time west of uh, Caroline, Burt Timber, in the Christmas, there was these footprints in the snow and they were like Wilt Chamberlain, huge strides, deep snow. Like, what is this? I don't recognize the tracks. Um, the UFOs, the things in the skies, the starcraft, like they're, they're continuous. Um, 2008, I found the BFRO, the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. And I went out on three different expeditions into the mountains in British Columbia on Vancouver Island, Sunshine Coast. And I got to meet John Green and we went to a place called Harrison Hot Springs. In North of Harrison Hot Springs on the east side of the lake is a provincial campground called Sasquatch Provincial Campground. So we went there. There were 36 of us, and I didn't know anything yet. But I was surrounded by 35 other people that knew something. And off into the woods we went, pairs of three. And it was underneath a power line with a, a teacher from Texas and a trapper. And we shared information for so long. And then I said, I'm leaving. I got to go sit in the forest for a while. So I walked out into the forest, found a nice tree, sat underneath this beautiful pine tree, a nice, big, curvy slouch to it underneath, sun in my face. And down from this hill, this hill is so steep. Let's see, uh, like that. It's that steep the mountain. This thing is coming down the mountain. You can hear it 
crush, 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 crush. And I get on my walkie-talkie and, hey, everybody, I'm hearing footsteps. Oh, good. Let us know what happens. And then the, the steps stopped. And then there was a wood knocking noise. It was like uh, two, two hockey sticks hitting together. There was a pause and then two more. I said, okay, everybody, I'm hearing wood knocks. I said, oh, good for you. This is good. Didn't know anything yet. And I'm just sitting there enjoying the moment, thinking, what the hell's going on? Here I am. You know, I'm spending all this money checking this out. Don't know. And I look over, and here's this face looking at me. It was galvanized steel blue. It had two eyes that were like charcoal briquettes. Its nose came down on a 45 degree angle, and it was the size of a five gallon pail. And it was still. It didn't look, it didn't shake, it didn't move, it didn't blink, it was just still. So Ron Moorhead has a re recording of uh, some Sasquatch from California, and they call it samurai chatter. So they make these noises like you don't understand. <laughs> So this is what it sounded like on the recording. So what do I know? I just blurted this stuff out to this face in the forest. And nothing, nothing. He just stared, looked at me. But I had this brand new Snowy camera I bought for this adventure. So I pushed the button, click, lens cap falls off. Boop. I put it up, but it can't see in between the trees. This face is way in there. So it focuses on the first tree, the second tree, the third tree, back to the second tree, over to the fifth. And the camera was zooming in and out, in and out. I put down the camera and the face is gone. Well, fear ignited. The hair came up on my arms, on the back of my neck, goosebumps everywhere. I crammed all my gear in my backpack and I ran through the blackberry bushes with all the thorns on them, ripping the height off of me, but I don't care. I better get out of there. And I took off as fast as I could, rejoined the trapper and the school teacher, told them what I saw. What I saw. Anyway, the next day we go back to the same location with the team, six, seven, eight of us. These are the experienced people. They scoured the hill, never found any footprints. And the fella went over to where I saw this thing. I sat back in my same spot. And this guy went out to where the, I saw the face. And he says, is it here? I said, no, it's over more. Here, over more, over more. Then he takes off his hat and he holds his hat out. He says, is it over here? I said, yeah. Well, he says, it's 14 feet down right here. And there was no footprints, of course. Didn't find any footprints. But on the hill, we did, we did find uh, these spots that were like couches. Great big places where these creatures lay and they looked down in the hill where the beaver pond was waiting for their supper, I guess. When any deer come along, maybe they go down and get them. I don't know. Uh, that was 2008. That was my first experience. I've seen one now. The next uh, couple of months, I go to Seashells on the Sunshine Coast of Vancouver. There's 36 of us again. There's rocks tossed into our fire ring. Um, at night, there's lights going off in the forest. Is it trail cameras? I don't know. That was 2008. Uh, I got white noise from a tree, a tree that gives off white noise. You know, like when you turn on the TV in the hotel room so you can sleep at night. Um, the guy that was running the show, he had uh, three people in his car. And the guy in the front seat, that was, would be his first sighting. The mother in the back was her second, and the daughter was her third. And the driver, it was his fifth sighting. One of them walked right across the road at 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, my th third expedition to 2008, it was up the Campbell River on Vancouver Island. We got way out into the forest west, and I found an old railroad line that was used for logging logs way back when, which was very interesting for me, being a locomotive engineer. And then this crow shows up and he lands on the tree and he says, hello. 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 And I'm thinking, did you just hear that? 
And he said, yeah. I said, what did it sound like? It sounded like he said, hello. Like, this crow is just amazing. A raven, I guess. Not a crow, a raven, a large, larger one. My goodness. So 2008 opened up the door to me. I had five more years to go to retirement. And then I found the Monroe Institute had uh, an office, a facility on Vancouver Island. Paul Elder was running it. So I went down to Las Vegas to attend the remote viewing courses. And, uh, oh, what was the guy's name? Dr. Gallenberger, he teaches how to bend spoons and forks and how to influence dice. So we were trying to influence, influence dice in Las Vegas so we could gamble and win money, which is kind of fun. But the uh, remote viewing class that I took from Paul Elder there was a two-day course. It was just like, wow, that opened up some more doors for me. And the people that attended this course from all over just to attend this, there was 12 of us. You know, and only, only a few people that are really desirable to know show up. So you get the, the nut jobs, right? So I showed up with my fellow people that were checking things out. Then this guy turns around and he says, I'm going to tell you a story. He said, well, one of my friends uh, is an artist. And uh, he got visited by one of the star people. And, one of them, and they said, I want you to sketch my face. And the guy said, go away, leave me alone. And the star person kept on coming back. Sketch myself, sketch me, sketch me. So after six weeks of this, the guy said, finally, oh, okay, I'll do it. So he sketched him. And he said, uh, two years later, here is the same being that's on the movie Avatar. That's the same one that he was sketching two years earlier. So that was pretty cool. The uh, remote viewing class was really, really, really good for me. Opened up a few more things. So then I had to go to the Mineral Institute and I took the gateway course, the very first one, the prerequisite. And they take you out of your body with alpha, delta, theta, beta, and they get you to synchronize the right side with the left and find that little spot and they take you out. And Robert Monroe, through his guided meditation, took me out of my body, took me out over the room, over the city, over the world, out past the moon, out past Mars, out past Jupiter, and way out there by Pluto. And he says, look down here at all of this. And it was just incredible. I could see it all. And then after the sessions are 38 minutes to 42 minutes long, he brought us back. And I wept uncontrollably for five hours. It was just like, wow, this is what I've been waiting for. So I went back and took another one called Lifeline, where you help the souls that are lost, that are trapped on this plane, you know, like for ethnic cleansing in Africa, a village would be burnt down and all the souls would be left there. So you go in and you clean them up and show them where to go and move on their way. So that was another amazing course that I took. So now all of that comes to an end for me. I've got Cutting through that door, I like I like it, and then uh, CE five shows up into my world. So then I meet Corinne and Celia and the rest of these people in Calgary, and well, I guess Simon Parks was before that. I found Simon Parks, hang, hung out with him when he first showed up. Then I still listen to his stuff, but back to the CE five. So now I'm with these like-minded souls who are out in the forest, out in the fields, and, and seeing this stuff. And it's just like, wow, it's right here all the time. And now I'm wandering around with my Bigfoot people with the CE5 knowledge. And I'm seeing in the, in the grass, on the rocks, you know, after a rainstorm, after a windstorm, and I'm wandering around and there's all of these little pieces of straw, like the size of toothpicks or so, and they're all piled up in an intricate design with a few seeds from a plant and a little pebble on a stone by a river. And I'm not thinking of squirrels doing this, right? This is not a, a bird setting this all up. So I put a little stone beside it and I come back 
you know, many hours later and there'd be another rock there beside it. Like, who's doing this? There's nobody here but me and my other guys. And I'm showing this to the other guys. Like, and I say, wow, we don't know what it is, but we start looking around and then you can start seeing it. It's like reading the newspaper when you go for a walk in the forest. All these big trees that are bent over and then they're held down and it's weaved like a tennis racket where the heavy end of the, the tree is sticking up where all the roots are and the rest of it's sticking down. And you start looking at this stuff and you say, wow, I don't know who's doing this, but I can't pick this up. And then we wandered around a field or in, the, in the mountains west of Calgary where all the trees have been cut and all there are stones, stumps. And on the south side of the stump, there's these three stones piled in a little triangle on the south side of the stump. And we go out, you know, 600 acres of all devastation. And we're wandering around in there and here's another stump with three stones on the south side. We wander around some more. You know, we pass 100 stumps and there's another stump with three stones on the south side. Is that a squirrel doing this? Is it a mark? I don't know. But once you start looking at this stuff, Ooh, what the heck is going on here? There's something going on. I don't know what it is yet, but it's like reading a newspaper, possibly. It's just another language. Anyway, I keep looking at this with my guys, and now we're seeing the orbs in the forest. These balls of light, they're red. Mostly the red were west, west of Calgary, they're mostly red. We're seeing spots of light that like uh, flash bulbs are coming on and off in the forest too. And then we got invited to a place north of Tofino on Vancouver Island, Quackwit Wilderness Resort. It's $3,500 a night. Only the rich and famous go there. But we got asked to come out prior to the opening of the seasons to see if we could see what was going on because the uh, person that runs the place the wife saw a Sasquatch and a juvenile eating clams right off the ocean, right outside the window. And he, John was his name, is his name. He was riding his horse with a bunch of paying customers behind and his horse stopped, digged right in and the horse wouldn't go any further. So he gave it the heels. Come on, let's go there. Trigger, come on. And the horse said, no way. Flared his nostrils. I, I'm not going. So the other guys caught up to him and they said, well, are we going to continue on? He says, no, nah, not today. He says, I don't know what it is, but we're not going. So they went the other way around. This horse, these horses in this area, no bears. There's all kinds of bears all over the place there. But there was something other than that. So Steve Isdall, I sent off that report to Steve. Steve Isdall. There's his name on the bottom. So I sent off my report to Steve and he says, horses, no bears, and they don't act like that. So he says, no doubt it was probably a Sasquatch. So we went, walked in across this covered bridge to a, an old abandoned gold mine. And it was just like, wow, the Sasquatch writings in the trees. It was just incredible. Never seen anything like it. And I pointed it out. We all pointed it out to the guys. And we, on the way back out, we crossed the bridge and there was a wood knock in the, in the distance. So there was a, a Sasquatch sitting there all the time. Nobody knew about it, but he sent off a warning to the rest of the tribe and said, day watch. Okay, they're gone now or something. I don't know what they mean, what, what the language is. But. So we went back that night. We set up our camp tents there and we slept out in the ground. And about 1.30 in the morning, it's time to go to bed. So we went to the bridge to hang our food off the bridge. And we stayed together in groups, two and two. And when we came back, there was a wood knock. The other two reported it to us. So now the other two guys, they take off to go hang their food. And what do they get? There's a wood knock as well. So there was one of them just like, I don't know, 100 feet away, just sitting right there watching us. So I got a FLIR device and I'm looking through the FLIR device and all these trees out there, 
And here was this ball of light on the side of this tree that you could pick up with the FLIR device. But you looked at it and you couldn't see it, but yet it was there. And I've seen that a couple of times now with different FLIR devices. There's something there, but you can't see it. But the FLIR device is picking it up. So that was a really interesting trip, that one. And then I had the uh, CE5 team down here to Medicine Hat. And we headed off to south of the hat and the girls were down into the coulee hanging around these big, large round rocks that are there. These rocks are the size of Volkswagens. They're big circles. And there was a drone in the sky. We had a drone in the sky. And as I'm watching this drone camera, I can see it, can see in the bottom of the corner of the drone camera, there's this signature of heat like heat on the road you can see it on the, in the tv screen and i looked down into the coulee and i could see this thing and it's just like a shimmer a see-through entity and it's just wiggling around there forms the shape of a tear and goes up and it's gone and the girls said they heard an electrical discharging noise like aluminum foil crumpling okay when it took off or when it was there so we landed the drone in the back of the pickup truck. And that's cool. Like, this is a big toy for a big boy. And I'm watching all this. And I look to my right, and there's a barbed wire fence. It's just 12 feet away. And on the other side of the fence is this see-through entity. It's two feet off the ground. It's three feet tall, five feet long, like a flag. And it's just a shimmer, like looking through cellophane, like plastic. And it's just, and I say, what are you? And it just floats away and it's gone. That's the fourth time I've seen this. And I, and I put a, geez, I've got so many directions to go here with this story. I, uh, in the missing 411 books, David Politis' stuff, there's a lady by the name of Jan Maccabee. She was uh, hunting deer in a tree stand, bow and arrow. And she saw this thing coming from tree to tree to tree. And it was like the, on the movie, The Predator, that cloaked entity that went around fighting Arnold Schwarzenegger, a chameleon type thing, like heat on the road. She saw that thing. And I put in there a comment. I too have seen this twice. I saw it in Idaho when I was on my motorcycle. And then I saw it again the next day in Montana. And then I just saw it here just recently with the CD5. So I made a, a note on the YouTube comment. And I got a reply from a fellow from Seashells. He says, Brian, you're the sixth person I know that has seen this. He says, I know of three homeless people that have seen it and two police officers, and now you. So I've been putting this in everywhere. Well, not everywhere, but different locations where there's like five people that possibly have, could have seen this, and they have seen it as well. So back to the coulee there with the CE5 team. Um, the sun had set twilight and I have my laser pointer and I'm shining it into the coulee. The top of the prairie is up here and the bottom of the coulee is way down. But I'm just shining it in there and it's I'm 100 yards out. And all of a sudden as I'm running this across, this ball of light comes on. And I said to Bridget who's standing right, he said, what did you see? He said, I just saw a ball of light come on. And I said, me too. Like I ran the pointer back across all around it and never came back on it. What was that? I don't know. Okay. So I'm just wandering around the forest, just wandering around the prairie, and I'm seeing this stuff. So then all of these years, I've been drawn to look at the sky when something tells me to look. And I see these clam-shaped clouds. They look like a clam with all the veins on them. And they're just, and some of them go from horizon to horizon. And I've been taking pictures of these things for years. And I found a fellow, Del, Delanov Star Livingstone. He's is in Brampton, Ontario. He's like 82 years old. He just put out a book. Um, the Divine Starships of the Heavenly Host or something like that. It was $100 for this book. It's all full of pictures. 
I sent him 81 of my photographs and he, he put eight of them in there of my photos in there. And he says, yeah, you, you're seeing what everybody else is seeing, Brian. So what he is saying is that they're, these ships are in the fifth dimension. You can't see them, but they're giving off their energies and the clouds are bouncing off their energies, much like a, a piece of paper with a magnet underneath it and the magnet uh, iron filings on top of the paper, you can see the magnetic lines of force. He's saying this is what the clouds are picking up, the ships. So all of these certain clouds are ships that you can't see. So I thought, okay, that's kind of cool. Maybe, maybe not, maybe yes. Who am I to say no, but something's calling me to them. And then on the train one day, I was 60 miles from home. And something called me to look out the window and I look up and here's this sylph, S-Y-L-P-H, sylphs. They're the elemental beings that are up there. And this one was uh, like a caterpillar, great big long thing with fuzzy hair all around it. And I said, wow, I think I know who you are or what you are. And I go another 40, 30 miles down the road and I look up and it's still there. I go another 30 miles, I look up, it's still there. Finally, I get to my destination. I get off the train and I look up and I said, holy shit, you followed me for 60 miles. There you are. And then I go through the internet to a place called educateyourself.org. And in there, there's a section that says selfs. So I went through all of that and there was a picture of the same one that I had seen. It was just like, wow, how cool is that? And then since then, I've seen a whole bunch of them that are just like angels, just beautiful angels. I've seen two of my own, plus one other one on the internet. I'm taking these pictures, submit them. So then I, uh, I get sick. And I can't move my arm. Can't brush my teeth. Can't wipe my ass. Like, what the hell? So I go and get some help from this, uh, the natural healing clinic. And I meet this lady, Donna, Mer Donna Ray. And she introduces me, she, she fixes me. Turns out it was gout. She fixes me. And then she introduces me to the uh, theric weavers. Uh, these things are made by the other Dalai Lama. These are rare earth stones and crystals, geomag, put in a best special way with rare earth magnets. So this will drive negative entities out of a body, heal you, the self-cleaning. You don't have to do anything to them. It's like healing for a dummy. So it works really good. I like it because I'm a dummy. I don't know anything. So she introduced me to these things. There's this one, that's, that's the biggest one. And I got a littler one, this guy here. I use him for dowsing, like a pendulum. He works really well. And these crystals are grown. He, he grows his own crystals. So Donna Ray introduced me to etheric weavers. And then of course, then she shows me the Vogel crystals for pranic healing. So we take the courses of pranic healing so that was just another, you know, rabbit hole I had to go down. So then as I'm driving the trains and it's, the weather is getting kind of ugly and the kid beside me says, well, I'm going to get wet, but I got to, well, we got to stop in this town to pick up some boxcars and set some off. And I said, it's not going to happen. We're going to talk to Father Cloud. And we're going to ask him not to rain on us. And when we leave, he can start to rain. Yeah, sure. So I send out a prayer. And I ask Father Cloud to take it easy on us. And sure enough, you know, it's dark. It's windy, but it doesn't rain. And as soon as we leave, it rains. So I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Months go by, same situation. I ask Father Cloud to lighten up. And rain later. Sure enough. Then I'm on my motorcycle. I've been on a motorcycle all my life. 
And now I'm just finding out about Father Cloud. So I say to him, hey, please, don't rain on me. Wait until I'm by the corner, and then you can rain. And it worked. Doesn't work all the time, but it works. And then I'm in Glacier National Forest on the road to the sun, Logan Pass in Montana. And it's just like Mordor. It was just coming down. Rain, thunder, lightning, horrible. And I said to my two guys, I said, let's just stop here. We'll take some tobacco. We'll make a gift to Father Cloud. And we'll ask to see if this will work. And sure enough, we're in a little bubble with sunshine. And the cars are coming at us with the windshield wipers going. And I'm thinking, wow. And then I find the weather shaman. So I had to have a look at this. And sure enough, in the weather shaman, this guy goes up and talks to Father Cloud. And he says, nobody talks to us anymore. Because the hairless humans down there don't talk to the Father Cloud anymore. So I'm thinking, wow, really? So now I'm practicing this. Because if you don't do anything, nothing's going to happen. But if you do something, something might happen. So this is what I'm doing. I'm doing something. So when the winds are blowing and it's about to storm and it's going to wreck your house or your garden or your trees, I get a knife and I go stick it in the ground out in the front yard and I say a prayer to Father Cloud and say, please go around and leave my house alone. And sure enough, I've been having some success. Because if you do nothing, nothing's going to happen. But if you put out some intent, something might happen. So this is what I've been doing. And I'm getting success with it. So and then you start looking at the Andes. So these are the nature beings that are out there wandering around in the water. And you've seen them moving across on the pond that you can't see. Hmm, could it be? And then of course we got Pythagoras, right? With the uh, music of the spheres trying to get to that special spot. And then there's Walter Russell. Walter Russell is like another Pythagoras. He's found the gift of getting to that place, that spark that never, never dies. So I had to go a little farther and try out a few other things. So I went and got into the DMT one day. I found a friend. I smoked it, touched my lips. And as soon as it touched my lips, it was like kaleidoscope of color. It was incredible. I had my second pull. And it was, I could see through into the body, I could see through the walls, I could see through and into depth of all around us. And as I just sat there and looked at everything, I didn't see anything else. I should have probably had my third possible thing. It was just incredible. It lasted for seven minutes, just looking at all of this kaleidoscope of color. It was just incredible. After 15 minutes, I was back to where I could, couldn't see that anymore. After 30 minutes, I was out walking around having a drink of water. And for the next three days, I was very happy. Very, very happy. So two of the CE5 in our group, we decided to try something a little outside of the box. We went out into the Rocky Mountains. We got our gravity chairs. And we took five grams of mushrooms each. And we played back in the chairs and we allowed to have what to happen happen. And there was this web above us, like a tennis racket, like a screen on your window. And you could push your hand into it and it would come back right around your arm, like pushing your hand into a balloon. And you could just see this. It was just right above us, just six inches above us. And beyond that, it was like looking at a, a printed circuit, all the connections and piping and little lights, like a ship, the bottom of a ship. And I said, what do you see? And he says, I see all these connections and stuff. What do you see? He says, I see a ship. Like the three of us were seeing the same thing. It was very interesting. 
And then, of course, there was the, the uh, bioluminescence things that were floating around us that we could see and notice. And there was lights in the pavement. It was just like, wow, another side that was right there that we couldn't see before because we only see a certain bandwidth, right? You guys all know that. You know there's more above, more below. We only hear a certain frequency. There's more above, more below. So by doing that, so we went and tried it again another night, three months later. You know, we're, we're not teenagers. We're not out there for just to get high. We're experimenting into other realms. And this is what we want to find and break, break through into. And yeah, we run into the same things again with more flash bulbs. In the same spot in the sky, there was seven flashes. Bang, bang, bang. What do you see? We got one guy that's really good at seeing. And he says, this is a ship right there. And I says, I can see it. He said, well, I'm seeing this as the flash bulbs. But his sight is so now that he can see them out of the peripheral. And as my days continue, you know, there's more days behind me than in front of me. I'm seeing more stuff out of the corner of my eyes. I'm seeing little things, big things. Like yesterday, I went out into the deck and there was this big black beam of light. And if you looked at it, you couldn't see it. But if you looked away from it, you knew it was there, you could see it. So I took a series of photographs, but I haven't checked them out yet. Um, I went to Idaho to study free energy devices with uh, John Bedini. He's now gone. He and his brother Gary were taken out but not to lunch, eight hours apart. They both died of a heart attack. But here's uh, one of his Rife machines. It's a sideband generator. You can buy these things. So it's uh, just a little mini Rife machine. You hook it up to a, a, a generator that makes a, a sine wave. And this thing will attach a little ball onto that wave. So it'll be kind of like putting a, a marble in a garden hose. And that marble will go through the garden hose and clean out the garden hose and pop out the other end. So this attaches on that frequency to bust out all the different cancers and stuff in your body that doesn't need to be there. And he figured out how to do it. So I've got a sheet of copper. I sleep in, a, in the kids' room where the bunk bunk beds are so I got a sheet of copper in the top bunk and a sheet of copper on the bottom and I got this thing hooked up and I'm laying in the frequencies at night so I'm, I'm sleeping pretty good actually but we'll see how well my longevity plays out in all of this and I'm hoping it will of course intent has a lot to do with it right um and for my hot tub I got a hot tub outside that I haven't changed the water in five years, and I don't use chlorine. I don't use bromine. I have, but I didn't like it. I have tried hydrogen peroxide, and it caked up on the inside of my plumbing, and I didn't like it. So then I found Adja Clarity. It's a liquid ionic sulfite, and I use this in my hot tub with colloidal silver. And I make my own colloidal silver with two coins and some batteries. And my water's been in a hot tub for five years. And I took a glass out and I put it in the kitchen. And my wife came home and I said, here, try this water. See what you think of it. And she said, that tastes all right. Yeah. I said, it's out of a hot tub. And she says, no. And I said, yep. Yeah. So there's, I got, I got a water storage, I guess, right? So she things go south. I have some drinking water available. Yeah. So I try to tell everybody about this for their hot tub. So you can be chemical free. So yeah. What else can I tell you? Would you, would you like to speak about um, the fear or when you're in fear and when you're not in fear? Yeah. What is that? How that changes suddenly sometimes for you? Yeah, isn't that interesting how that comes over you? Where you can be in that spot and then all of a sudden there it is. Like, is that the ego, the mind? That negative thing, the cow, 
if I can call it that, calendar engine. And then if you go back to God, the creator, and you can push it away. And then there's always this battle going on. Oh, yeah, you got to do this. Well, what about tomorrow? Shut up. Go away. I want to be back here in the now in the business. And then it comes back in and you recognize it. You push it away again. Yeah, I don't know. And the more I recognize it, and the more I get back into that one spot where I can keep it away. But then again, if you got the TV going and the radio going, you're, you're pulled right back into this again, in my opinion. So I've shutting all that off and I'm walking now with every footfall kind of I'm recognizing it. Like I rode until the garden today in my bare, yesterday in my bare feet. I planted my potatoes, 66 of them. I was in my bare feet. It was so nice to get my shoes off. But every footfall brought me to my breath. And I'm, as I'm paying conscious attention to that, this is where I want to be again. Perfect. And then it, it slips away. And then you catch yourself again. And you, I bring myself back. This is my meditation, my contemplation. I'm not very good at meditating, but this contemplating and keeping my thought in one spot rather than have that monkey mind take me all over the world. Oh, my goodness. All you got to do is open up the TV or the newspaper, and there it is. It pulls you right back to their place. I don't want to be in their place. I want to be in my place with source, the isness, the all, the great creator. Yeah, that's where I am. And I listen to the birds and I hear music in their voice, putting me right back where I want to be in the isness again. Yeah. Ryan, I remember you telling me about that moment. You described that moment before when you saw through the branches and you couldn't take a picture of, of that face. And you, there was no fear. You were sitting there all alone in the forest and, and there's just no fear. And I, I have had moments like that too. And then you talked about it suddenly vanishing. Yeah, that fear. I was just like, here is a strange, strange being. I've never seen it. Don't know what the hell it is. I've heard stories about it. The natives all talk about it. Many people are seeing it. And here it is for me. And there's no fear. Like, it's just curiosity. Intrigue. And I want to know more. Let's, let's, let's engage it. I try to talk to it. Like, no fear. This is, you know, like stumbling onto a who knows what. And there it is. I can see it. And then when it was gone, it was like, <gasps> it was like, did it project something at me to cause this fear? Because it, I've, you know, you drive trains and you crash into things, right? You know, you run into cars, you run into trucks, you run over animals, you run into rocks, you run into each other. There's fear there. But this was different. I, I didn't have the hair come up in the back of my arms and, Cause me flight, like serious flight. Yeah, where, what is that? Where does it come from? How do you control it? And I'm getting better at controlling these things, actually. Yeah, when they do show up, yeah, you just kind of, oh, yeah. You know, like you walk around the corner and your partner's coming around the corner too and you didn't hear each other. Ah! Well, now I just, Oh, hi. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know how to get rid of it. Maybe you just have to encounter it over and over and over and get accustomed to it. It's like seeing the craft in the sky. When the star family shows up and there's, there's their ships. Like there was one night this light came on. And then it went out. And then this other one came on. And it went out. And then a third one came on at the bottom, came on, and it went out. And it was shaped like a triangle. And it was at twilight. No fear, just like, wow. Yeah. And then in, uh, let's see, I'm going to say 19, 
96 or so. I had to take a taxi to go get a, a coal train from Lethbridge. And it was at 10 o'clock at night, 10.30 at night. And I went out into the back of the engine to have a leak before we took off on this trip to take these empty cars to the mountains. And I looked up into the sky and here was this black triangle. It had uh, two points leading and a single point trailing. The two points had a light on it. All three points had a light on them as bright as Venus, as the brightest star you ever see or the International Space Station, all that bright. And behind the single point, there were seven other lights. Bright, dimmer, 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 fate, fate. The Big Dipper was in the sky. And as it went by the Big Dipper, it blocked out the Big Dipper. I had an opportunity to, the cab, the cab door of the locomotive was open. I yelled inside. I said, hey, guys, come out here and have a look. So these two other guys came out. All three of us are on the platform of the locomotive. We're all looking up. And from the northwest to the southeast, this huge black triangle went right over top of us, blocked out the Big Dipper, and vanished over into the southeast. Like, what was that? And I brought this up to the other guys later on in the years, and they said, I don't remember that, Brian. I don't remember that. And I said, wow, how can you not remember that? And then I was down in Area 51 on my motorcycle with my buddy. And there was, I've been down there three times. And this one time there was two jets in the sky leaving their contrails. You could just see the smoke out of the ass end of these planes. And we, I stopped. I had to have a look at this because I could only see one. And as I'm looking up there, I could see this one jet. But the other one was invisible. It was cloaked. But yet the engines were showing its exhaust. And I go, how can this be? And I said to my buddy, he said, please check that out. See that? And he said, yeah, I don't care. Like, it's just me, right? My friends around me don't care about this stuff. Some of them do. That's why I'm aligning myself with like-minded souls that are like me, that are seeing these things and questioning. Yeah. Uh, so another night down at Area 51, my very first time, uh, there was a Chuck that lived there. He got chased out of uh, Rachel, Nevada. And Chris was a bartender slash restaurant guy. That, the little alien in and Rachel and I wheel in there on my motorcycle and get a six pack of beer and some gasoline, tell them what I'm doing, ask questions. And they share their knowledge. And they said, if you want to go to the gate, this is where you go. So I went down to the mailbox, hung it right and went in. And as I was driving in on the dirt road, there's this truck coming out at me and he stops, turns around and goes back. So I follow him. I go right up to the gate and there it is, do not enter, no photography, authorized force. And these guys park and they go on top of the hill and they're looking down at me and there I am. Uh, hi, hi, this is me. Uh, Chuck says there's a camera here somewhere over here. So I'm looking for the camera, I find it, I take a picture of it. I say to the guys, okay, wave at me, say hello. Anyway, I leave. I go back, I tell Chuck and Chris what I did. Eh, good for you, blah, blah. Just another day for them. I go to bed. And at 4.30 in the morning, I'm awoken to this vibrating, pulsating noise. <laughs> Behind the mountain, it's getting brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. The moon is right up over here. But there's something going on. And then it rains a little bit. I got like 18 drops of rain on my tent. It hasn't rained there for a year and a half. I go into the little alien inn in the morning, share what happened. They said, no, there, you're seeing stuff. So I said, where else can I go? So they sent me off to the Nellis Air Force Base. There's no signs, nice paved road. He said, there's an abandoned house there and a tree. And from there, you go up on top of the hill and you can watch the jets fly around. So I went there and sure enough, there's these big jets and they're just a couple of feet off the ground flying around like go-karts. You know, like we would drive a go-kart. Yeah, these jets are flying around the valley in the desert. It was like, wow, so cool. Yeah. 
Then I went to the UFO Congress conference, had to go check that out. And everything that I've been reading and studying, there are the presenters. And I ran into Kiwani Lasparitis with the Sasquatch people, Sasquatch beings. And my wife and I went to Washington to hang out with him and 330 other like-minded Sasquatch people and to share our stories and listen to theirs. It was awesome. Awesome. I got to see sylphs in the sky, pointed them out. Barbara got to see some footsteps in the forest of these creatures. Uh, people are channeling them. So we got to hear from Balana, a Sasquatch, through Mike. Mike was sharing the stories. Yeah, it just didn't end there that weekend. It was just so, so cool. And then, then what happens? We get the, the flu that comes around and puts up a, a wall for everybody to travel. Yeah. Ryan, um, I'll share now, I'll share that little YouTube clip of, of a being in the forest. Let me just get that up here. Um, To find it on my screen. Okay, so look just around here. It's just very briefly, but you'll see something moving along this way. Oh, this one just down here. You see walking behind the. Oh yeah. You'll see him when he comes out. I can just move that back again and show it again. So it's just just along there. Now, this one just down here, you see walking behind the... Yeah. Is that one of the little people? That's I've got one. three stories of little people. Okay. Yeah, three. Well, like that, uh, the first, in 2008, when I made my first experience, I met a fellow by the name of Miller. What's his last, last name is Miller, Ron Miller? He was offering tours. He's from Michigan, and he was telling me that when he was in Michigan, he moved uh, this leaf, this leaf, a uh, skunk leaf, you know, the size of cabbage, great big leaves. He moved it away, and there was this footprint of a, of a human footprint, so small, like smaller than a child. He says, from the little people. I said, no way. And then there was uh, another girl that was in that same group. She was telling us that on the Malahat Highway between Victoria and Nainamo, there was little people sightings there. And just south of me into Montana, south of Harlem, there's a, a native reserve there. And there's two creeks. One's called Little People Creek, and the other one's called Little Persons Creek. So there's something there with that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll bring up the pictures that you sent me, Brian. Um, right here. Well, that and blue one right there, you see the triangle in there? This one here. Yeah, there's a triangle there. Yeah. It's right on the left-hand side of the screen. The center point is in the center of the screen. Yeah, right there, yeah. This, this, here, right? Right where the cursor is, that's the top of the top of the top edge. Yeah, so this, cool. do you think this is a black triangle, but invisible, interdimensional? It's something like, it's just the opposite of a, I've seen that many, 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 many times, either with white clouds or with those blue clouds. Mm-hmm. That one there, when you see a square, a square hole in a cloud, you got to take a picture because you see that little dot in the right eye there. Yeah, that thing right there. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't see that. It was a CE5 people in Calgary that brought it to my attention, and we zoomed in on it. And there's uh, there's something there. See, that's what that's another one of the examples of something that's drawn my attention, and I got to take a picture of it. <laughs> yeah, there's another one. That was a. Uh, I was sitting in the backyard drinking beers at my buddy's house, and I said, "Like, 
I just got up and walked over to the fence and looked at this. Like something just brought my attention to it. Like what kind of cloud is that? Who's in there? What does that? You see all the normal clouds below it. But when stuff like that shows up, this is like walking into the forest and seeing all the sticks piled up on one side of the tree and nothing on the other. Yeah. Oh, there's the clamshell one that I'm talking about. This is the ship in the fifth dimension that you can't see, but that the clouds are picking up on the magnetic lines of force, the electrogravitic portion of the craft. Uh, what word do you want to use? It's energy. And this is what uh, Del Star Nova Livingstone is telling us in his book about uh, these divine beings of the heavenly host that are there all the time, but you just can't see them. Nobody looks up at them. These things are everywhere once you start looking. Is it just a regular cloud? I don't know. I'm drawn to them. There's like there's an intelligence there or something that's picking on me to look. Hey, Brian, have a look at me. And I'm seeing this. Yeah, I've got dozens of pictures just like that. They're all similar, all similar. And that was from the square cloud because I took uh, about 14 pictures of that square cloud. And that was what's in the eye. It changed from these... Is there like a plasmoid anomalies? Have you heard of plasmoid anomalies? They just show up, there's silver things in the sky, they bounce around and they work off your intent. You can say, hi, I'm here, and they show up. Okay, so that's from... That one, that's right it. there, yeah. Okay. Correct. Fabulous. Yes. This, this is uh, one of Corinne's pictures. Yeah. She's got a camera. What is it? A Canon Super Shot 8 megapixel, 20 year old camera. Our, our photographs turn out best during twilight when the flash is about to start. And before the flash starts, these pictures all show up. Yeah, I've seen these all, all over the place, only with a camera. I can't see them with my eye. Mm -hmm. Much like orbs. So, uh, I, ha I have seen orbs, but the cameras pick them up much easier. Yeah, mm -hmm. fairies. These are pictures of Sue Walker. She's CE5 in New Mexico. I got to meet her at that Sasquatch event with the 330 people. Barbara and I went down there and these are her paintings. She gets telepathy from these beings and they say, this is me, take my picture. Much like that guy in uh, Las Vegas with the, the, the star family that said, take, sketch my face, sketch my face. And it turned out to be the avatar. So these beings telepath to her and she puts pen to paper and this is what she creates. Oh yeah, she's got like 60, 50, 60 different paintings, if not more now. Her and her husband, White Otter. Look at that ball, isn't that cool? Yeah. Is that an orb, is that a soul? Is that a, one of the forest peoples? Is that us? That is us, isn't it? A ball of light and energy. Yeah. Well, I can see how fear can take over right away, but after a while, they're, they're all friendly just like us. Yes, there are good ones. There's bad ones, just like everything. That's Todd Standing's picture. This is a yep. picture? Yeah. Yep. That's a picture. OK, so this is not a drawing. This is an actual photograph. That's an actual photograph, yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Yes, yes. I encourage you to go out in the forest and look for stuff like this. Yes, there is wind load. Yes, there's snow load. Yeah, there's people that can do certain things, create stuff like this. But when you start looking at some of it when it's weaved like a tennis racket with 
with trees that are so heavy that it would take four or five people to pick up, you got to say, hmm. Yeah, I don't think it was the bears. I don't think it was a moose. But are these markers? That this is my edge of my territory? Because if you find one and then you find another one farther down, it would be a third one farther away in the same line. It's hard to say. I don't understand yet. I'm still studying, but I recognize them now. And once you start seeing them, they're almost everywhere. Uh, this is a photograph again, isn't it? Yeah, that came out of Steve Isdall's works. It was submitted to him. Yeah. Oh, man. And it sounds like these things are everywhere now. Everywhere. And can they just blimp out, blimp in? There's lots of stories like this. I went down to uh, Black Rock, Red Rock, Red Rock Springs, Wyoming, to interview a native fellow down there. He saw two Sasquatch walk into a tree in Oregon or Washington. I forget now. But I went down there just to talk to him. And he said, yeah, I saw them walk right into a tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and there's, uh, this is like in the bottom of the picture, it says uh, Schwartz Astronomy. This is Bruce Schwartz from Montreal. He has a 14 inch telescope with a $6,000 Nikon camera on the back end. And this is a picture of the moon. This is uh, probably Bancini crater or Maricenertatus. There's two of them that he's found these buildings, these complexes. And he's on YouTube. His uh, handle is Bruce Sees All. Bruce Sees All. And he's just a regular man. I, I sponsor him on uh, Patreon because if, if this should be like in Time Magazine, in Newsweek, like, and his information is not getting out. But there it is. Does that look like a city? It sure looks like something's going on there, isn't it? Yeah. And he's got dozens and dozens of photographs. And he's showing the green vegetation on the moon. I think he's found a spot where there's a lake. He's found a lake, body of water. Uh, oh, yeah. And the UFO is a craft. He's got multiple craft in a single phrase in movies. He's catching them flying in and out. And it looks like they're creating the type of haze or a smoke to camouflage what's underneath. He's uh, finding that as well. Mm, okay. Very interesting. And now he's using infrared cameras now to catch what's in his backyard, which we are all encouraged to do. Just grab a infrared camera if you can and just turn it on at night and you're going to see things that you can't even see that are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this infrared stuff just doesn't stop. Yeah. Well, very uh, interesting. So we, so would you like to take some questions? I don't know anything. So how can I answer anything? <laughs> sure, go ahead. I'll do what I can, but I'm just a regular guy that's out here like you guys. Just Raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, Rob, yes. Hi, Brian. How are you? Awesome, Rob. Nice to hear you. Yeah, good to hear you, mate, as well. Um, I had one thing. It's something I'm sort of learning at the moment, and it's um, um, prior and during to you having... Uh, specifically like C5 experiences what is the feeling that you feel <clears throat> in your body is do you have like a tingling a sensation a feeling or do you have something in particular that you know that something's about to happen yeah it's like intuition it's a knowing it's just like oh yeah I got this yeah it's just like okay I know the answer to the question it's just like that it's just there's no tingling. There's nothing else. It's just uh, annoying. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, there's some people, there's quite a few people that I know, they have particular things that they have happen, like their ears might ring or a vibration or 
they get a strange sort of an, another sense in their body that they don't normally have. And that's usually an indication that something is either about to happen or they're just about to have like an experience. So that's something I'm trying to learn instead of sort of, you know, sat out in the field, you know, doing field work with everyone. And then we see something I'm trying to now preemphase that and take notice of my own thoughts and feelings prior to it. And whilst the experience is happening, so not really take notice of the experience, but the feeling that I have prior and during it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I, I do get uh, the ringing in my ears. All of a sudden, you be either one ear or the other. I don't notice anything else, but I do have that. I've had it sometimes where it's so overpowering where I got to grab a hold of the chair or the railing that I'm going to fall down. Um, is it my blood pressure? dropping out or did a something happen i don't know the wi-fi got turned on or the cell tower do something but I'm, I'm getting those things that and it'd be at like at 10 o'clock in the morning <sighs> what the fuck was that <laughs> okay like that's it's a different feeling but for when i'm seeing stuff it's a knowing it's like a happy happy thing like when the self show up this is like Hey, Brian, are you down there? Like, we're calling you. And I look up and say, holy shit, there you are. Hi. That's what I get for the selfs and these CE5 things. But yeah, Rob, on those other things, yeah, I don't know. I get the, the vibrations in my ears. I don't get a tingling or anything. I just hear tones, different tones in my ears. Every okay, time. cool. I've got one more question, actually, um, and it's, Based on the recent um, videos that the Navy have been releasing, uh, that came out yesterday, and um, it was one taken from on board a, a naval ship out of, of the coast of San Diego, uh, but they're now saying that the data that they use to collate that um, images and the information was recorded through, it's what's called a um, S-band, frequency now these s i've been looking at this today and they're between two and five gigahertz so then i had gone straight into google and then played a two to five gigahertz sound bite uh so my next thing is going to then my next when i go out doing some ce5 i'm going to try and transmit that frequency because i've got a strange feeling now that the military of they know how to get some form of communication going. I think they've sussed something, but um, because th these things are appearing when they're, you know, right at that point. And there's so many different accounts now coming out where there's so much military involvement and then these things are appearing. So personally, I think that they've, they've cottoned on to something there. So that's maybe a thing for some of the others, the CE fivers that I know are watching. Maybe that might be an idea of maybe we can try that with radios or I'm just going to transmit it with my phone out through the radio, and see what I get from that. So that's my next little mission to try. But... Right on, Rob. Good idea. Good idea. Yeah. All right. Nice to speak to you anyway. I had a, I'll be three Christmases ago now or four Christmases. Everybody was at the house here. I'm going to have, I've been drinking. It's time to have a cigarette. I walk out onto the deck. It's Christmas. It's 25 below out here. And I said, hi, is there anybody here? And I get a flashbulb. And I said, really? Just like that. And I get a flashbulb. And I start to cry. I said, holy shit. Like you guys are right here all the time. Like, wow. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for being here. I'm sucking on my cigarettes. My nipples are sticking out. It's 25 below. It's, I've had enough. Put up my cigarette. I said, okay, guys, give me one more. Merry Christmas. You can't make this stuff up. No, it's there's cool, isn't it? Going, there's something going on. Tough, and no. if you're not looking, you're not going to see it. I've seen some crazy flash bulbs, mate. I mean, as big as the moon. No light. Like, crazy stuff. And I'm like, what is that? You know, 
<laughs> but we all have, you know, everyone that's on this probably is, you know, we all know it's, it's. It's real. It is real. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 There's another time we were in the forest and it was in the South. There was a beam of light came down and landed into the forest somewhere, but we all got to see this. So there was some sort of craft there. And this light came down. So was somebody going up or somebody getting down. But we got to see it. And in that same spot, there was this like uh, all these dots of light. Just going around all of this one area. And there had to have been 700 of these dots of light just coming on and off. It was like a sparkler on a birthday cake. Just all of these lights in this one area. And we got our binoculars out and we're looking at this. It was like a war going on or I don't know how to explain it, but that's what I looked like to me, a war going on, <laughs> all of these lights. And it lasted and lasted. And finally, okay, let's just put the, okay, I've had enough of this. Let's go on to something else. It's like the rest of the CE5 stuff for me. Okay, I've, we've all seen all of this stuff over and over and over. I'm ready for the school bus. Come down, pick me up, take me for a ride. I'll drive around and I'll pick up the rest of you. And then we'll go for a little trip and then we'll come back. That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> Happy days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have a question for Brian? Sabina, yes, let me just unmute you. One moment. Yeah, I do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in fact, I have two, if I may ask a, a second one. The first one goes to Brian. Um, and it is, it, it sometimes, or it, it really sounds nice what you are describing that uh, being addressed by telepathy and um, it sounds uh, light. Yeah. The experience of meeting, of having these experiences and so on. And is there something more to it that you might um, um, say that what do you do you also perceive uh, an intention behind that why you are seeing this or why this is being presented to you like this uh, do you know what i mean so that there is maybe a reason behind it that uh, these creatures or um, things are showing themselves to so some of us, oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's just us, we, we that are here in this group. We are going, when the weird, when the weird, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. So we're going to be the teachers. Like, who are they going to come to? When the, everything starts falling apart here and going to shit, we're going to be the teachers. Like, relax. It's just another one of our star family. Yeah, I see. Enjoy it. I, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why I've been called to this. Yeah. I don't know why you guys were called to this. I don't know why you're here, but I think you know why. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And could it, you just repeat? You just said the weird becomes what? When the going gets weird, the, the weird, weird turn pro. Turns professional. Professional. Ah, oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah the weird turn professional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw that way back when, and I kept it all these years on the wall in my garage. When the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. Yeah. It's like when I plant my garden. I, I talk to my seeds. Hey, buddy, you're going to grow for me to nourish me. When I'm cutting up the celery and the onions to make my stir fry, thank you for giving your life to benefit my body. I talk to them. Mm. And I bless my food. I, I structure my water. I talk to my water before I, I bring the jug in. Right. Yeah, I put intent, try to put intent in everything. It's yeah. like going to the grocery store, you put your parking spot out there mm -hmm. and the guy backs out and you drive in. Yeah, or is there a policeman around the corner with a radar gun, you slow down, sure enough. Oh, there was one time on the train, this would be like 1980. And I'm sitting there with this old gentleman, and he starts blowing the whistle. Toot, 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 toot. And I mean, what the fuck? Nobody else blows a whistle here. And he's going, boo, 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 boo. 
what, what's up, Charlie? And we go around the corner, and here are these maintenance of way guys on their little putt butt. They're throwing it off the track and got out of the way as we went by. So his spidey senses was telling him to blow the whistle, save those men's lives. And he said, Brian, let that be a lesson to you. Oh my God. So in all those years, I've never forgotten that. And I put in that spidey sense and stuff as the hair comes up in my arms right now. Put that to use. So when I started driving trains and there was something that entered into my thought, hey, you better slow down here or look a certain direction or blow the whistle, give advance warning. Yeah, I heed those, those warnings. When my spotty senses kick off, yeah, I pay attention. That intuition, it's like going into the forest. Like Ona, when she goes that one spot where it's kind of dark, you don't feel comfortable. Yeah, you just don't go there, right? You just don't go there. Yeah, that's what I do. And that's what I feel. But I don't feel that with the, uh, the CE5 stuff. You know, when we, there was one guy, he said to the, we were out there in that, the group of 12 of us, where the ball was, where the shimmering see-through entity was. Later that night, Graham, he laid back. Oh, no, you might want to interview this guy later, Graham. He's laying back there, and we're all there, 12 of us. And he says, I wonder if you guys are my lab up there. Flashball. And we all went, wow, right on cue. And he said, really, you guys are my lab. Another flashball. Yeah. What do you think? Can it be? Mm -hmm. Who am I to say no? When I'm walking around the forest and I see mushrooms hanging in branches that are five feet off the ground with the same guy, Graham. We were walking around in the Rocky Mountains. Walking around, walking around. And there's a mushroom in the tree. I'm like, okay, maybe it's the squirrels that are doing that. I don't know, but when you see seven mushrooms, eight mushrooms, that are the size of you know, your fist sitting in the trees. I guess am I supposed to be eating more mushrooms? I don't know, but I see this stuff. And I just pay attention. Yeah. yeah. It's cool, eh? Very cool. Yeah. Anyone else have a question? Can I ask a second one? Also? Sure. Um, before we forget it, um, it, it, it would be a question to Rob about something he mentioned. Is it also possible? Of course. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned something going on with a two to five gigahertz frequency. Uh, could, you, could you please say again what this kind of thing was? I'm asking for a specific reason because this is exactly the frequency of the fifth generation of mobile phone radiation that is going to be imposed on us. And that is definitely a military use also. So, so what was it, what you experienced with this frequency? Um, I didn't get this. Yeah, Rob, are you there? Wait a minute, ask I need to unmute you. Oh, yeah. am I unmuted now? Yeah. Yeah, hi Sabina. Yeah, um, it was something that I, uh, I saw last night actually, and it's called S-Band Radar. That's a new system that the um, the Navy and the military are using, and it's it's something to do with the electromagnetic scale. So that's right down our street straight away, because we know that a lot of these beings work possibly in the electromagnetic frequency ranges. But um, that that's um, one of these new systems where they picked it up. And it's called an S band radar. So how that, that how do you spell that? E S P A N or E S No S band S frequent S band. Yeah, that's yeah, S S band radar. Radar. Okay. Yeah, and there's gonna be more information coming out about that probably in the next few days to the next week i think uh there's a guy called jeremy corbell that's releasing a lot of things with um george knapp at the moment and they're just they're releasing so much stuff at the moment it's crazy so 
but that I found really interesting. So, you know, there could be something maybe in that specific band frequency. And yes, you're right, it is used, I think, uh, something for telecommunications. Um, so it is all linked in around that sort of system. Now, whether they're using 5G towers and triangulating multiple towers without us knowing and emitting frequencies to a certain point, I don't know. But it's it's just an interesting theory that, you know, maybe some of us can maybe try out ourselves with our groups. So. Okay. I think right. what I'll do now is um, we'll come to an end for the YouTube and then we can streaming and then we'll move on to us privately talking. I think that's probably a very good idea. So, um, Brian, would you would you like to? I know you said you would like to say a prayer. Would, would you like to finish off the YouTube with your prayer? Sure. Yes, please. Thank you. Let's see if I can get this. So I got this from Jessica Morocco. And it's for the highest potential. On behalf of all humanity, I want to make a request to the universe. I would like to ask all of you to join me in state. We ask that all poisons and toxins that are put into our bodies, both voluntarily and involuntarily, be neutralized and rendered harmless. Okay, I gotta wait for it to go. We ask that all those who are fighting for humanity be protected and be allowed to voice their knowledge and truths. We ask that the ability to think for ourselves be preserved and encouraged and that all lies and manipulations be unveiled and shut down. We ask that all those who are responsible for the horrible crimes against humanity be held accountable and put in front of the high courts to be judged accordingly. We do not consent or agree with their agendas of mass genocide, their agendas of divide and conquer, and their agendas of dumbing us down. We thank the universe for providing us with this beautiful planet we call home, and together we work towards the highest unlimited potential for humanity. Yeah, for the highest unlimited potential of humanity. That's it. Thank you, Brian. And before we close, I'd also like to just take a moment to, to remember Israel, think of Israel. They're going through um, yeah, tough times. And we have C5 friends there. We want you to know that we can feel it. I can feel it certainly, and we're with you. We, we want to strengthen you and we want peace in Israel. And that peace spreading out, the peace spreading out, nothing else, just the peace and the love spreading out across the globe and the universe. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, so much. Oh, it's really, truly amazing and wonderful to, yeah, to get insight into how to look, how to, how to look at the forest in a different way, how to play with pebbles, putting pebbles out and seeing if pebbles are added. Just all those things, these ideas that you've shared with us, I think that's going to change for many of us the way we do CA5 or incorporate new things into our CA5. Yeah, so I will end the YouTube streaming. Thank